Today, we will talk about the use of GNSS and radio nav aids in VFR flights. First of all, let's see what is a nav aid. In aviation, a nav aid is a radio station installed on the ground that emits electromagnetic waves, which are used by onboard instruments to determine the current position of the aircraft and eventually navigate. There are several types of nav aids used in en route navigation, such as the NDB, the VOR, the VORDME, and the VORTAC. Each one of these nav aids has different characteristics and capabilities, but we will not get in detail with this in this video. However, we have to mention that in order to use these nav aids, certified onboard equipment is required for IFR flights. And although these nav aids are originally intended for IFR flights, they can be used by VFR flights as a reference for navigation, and that is what we will be dealing with in this video. So to start with this, let's look at some key concepts related to navigation with NDBs. A non-directional beacon, or NDB, is a nav aid that emits non-directional radio waves which are received by the aircraft's antennas. Now, in order to navigate with an NDB signal, the aircraft must be equipped with an automatic direction finder, abbreviated as ADF, or a radiomagnetic indicator, abbreviated as RMI. In simple terms, these instruments consist of a compass rose and a needle, which always points to the NDB station. With this in mind, there are two bearings that can be used as reference to navigate with an NDB. The first one is the QDM, which is the magnetic bearing to the station. In other words, this is the magnetic track that the aircraft would need to fly in order to proceed directly to the station. And considering the way in which an ADF or RMI work, this means that the tip of the needle will always indicate the QDM, which in this particular example is 360. Now, on the other hand, the QDR is the magnetic bearing from the station, which means that it indicates the direction in which the aircraft is located in relation to the NDB station. According to this definition, in an ADF or RMI, the tail of the needle will always indicate the QDR, which in this particular case is 180. So having seen these two concepts, let's look at an example. In this case, we can see that the aircraft is flying southbound, and according to the needle of the ADF, the QDM would be 315, since it is the bearing indicated by the tip of the needle. While the QDR would be 135, since it is the bearing indicated by the tail of the needle. So with this, we can see that by definition, QDM and QDR will always be opposites. Now, in this order of ideas, the position of the aircraft is always expressed in relation to the NDB, which means that we have to use the magnetic bearing from the station, or in other words, the QDR. Here for example, according to this ADF, we can see that the QDM is 122, and the QDR is 302. With this in mind, we would say that the position of this aircraft is the QDR 302 from the EPSIG NDB. Now, the thing is that, an NDB not only allows us to know our current position, but can also be used to identify checkpoints on the ground. Let's see an example. Here we have the EPSIG NDB, which is located close to several checkpoints that can be used for VFR navigation, such as towns or lakes. So in this case, using a chart, a plotter, and taking into account the magnetic variation, we can determine the approximate QDR that passes over each of these checkpoints. For example, the town of St. Paul is located on the QDR-198 from EPSIG NDB. This lake is on the QDR-133, Glarus is on the 090, and Lydnay on the 079. So with this, if the aircraft is equipped with an ADF or RMI, the pilot can use this information to complement the intended VFR navigation plan. But let's see more in detail how to use this technique in practice. Let's say we plan this VFR route, and there is an NDB nearby. In this case, during flight planning, we determine the approximate QDR for each checkpoint, and then, during flight, using dead reckoning in conjunction with the ADF, the pilot can double-check and monitor its approximate position. For example in this case, when the ADF shows a QDR of 276, the pilot knows that the aircraft must be flying over Leva, or at least, very close to it. In the same way, 
When the ADF shows a QDR of 294, the pilot can start looking outside for the St. Louis Lake. And finally, when the aircraft is flying over Porta Maria, the ADF will show a QDR of approximately 349. In this way, even though VFR navigation is mainly conducted by dead reckoning and visual references, navades can be used as a secondary navigation source to cross-check the information, especially when flying over unfamiliar areas. Now, if an NDB is located right in the middle of a town or city, it can be used as reference to fly directly there. In this case for example, there is an NDB very close to Isidro, which can be used by the pilot to proceed directly there, using the ADF after passing over San Mateo Lake. Now, something important to know is that an ADF not only works with NDB signals, but also, with signals emitted by any other radio station operating in that frequency band such as commercial AM radio stations. In these cases, the antenna of the station will act as an NDB, and therefore the needle of the ADF will point towards the station on the ground. For example, let's say that nearby the town of Clinton there is a commercial radio station called Classic Hits. In this case, if the pilot tunes its frequency in the ADF, the needle will point towards the transmitting antenna on the ground, allowing the aircraft to determine its position in relation to Clinton, and use it as a reference for navigation, just like an NDB. However, there are important aspects to consider when using commercial radio stations with the ADF. First of all, they are not an official nav aid, and therefore, they will not appear on aeronautical charts. Also, they may change their frequency or turn off the transmitting antennas without any previous warning to air traffic. And finally, they may have very weak transmitting power since they were not originally designed to be used as an avade. With this in mind, if you are still planning to use commercial stations as a reference for navigation in a VFR flight, the following practices and recommendations should be taken into account. Make sure that the station is currently operating and you know the exact location of the transmitting antenna. Verify that the strength of the signal is adequate and the indication of the ADF is consistent, and if possible, try to verify the name of the radio station by listening to it. Now, last but not least, even if everything is okay with the station, never use the ADF as the only reference for navigation in a VFR flight, since in this type of operation, the pilot has to navigate mainly by reference to visual checkpoints on the ground, and not by reference to the flight instruments. Now, if all the checkpoints on the route are towns or cities, it is very likely that each of them has at least one AM radio station. So in practice, it is as if we had an NDB at each of the checkpoints, as we can see in this example. This would greatly assist navigation, because if the pilot sets the ADF correctly on each leg, the needle will literally point to the next checkpoint on the route, making it less likely to get lost or deviate from the route. Now, similar to the NDB, a VOR can also be used as navigation reference for VFR flights. VOR stands for Very High Frequency Omnidirectional Range. It is a nav aid that emits omnidirectional signals known as radials. And in order to navigate with a VOR, the aircraft must be equipped with an HSI, an RMI, or a VOR dedicated instrument. Now, just like a QDR of an NDB, a radial is a magnetic bearing from a VOR station, and therefore, it determines the position of the aircraft in relation to the nav aid. For example here, this aircraft is in the 053 radial from the VOR. Now, in this order of ideas, visual checkpoints on the ground can also be identified by means of a certain radial from a nearby VOR. For example here, we can see that the town of St. Paul is on the 198 radial from Benito VOR. The lake is on the 133 radial, Glarus on the 090, and Lydne on the 079. Now, so far it looks like it is used exactly in the same way as an NDB. However, the thing is that most VORs have supplementary systems that add additional capabilities, such as the distance measuring equipment, or DME, or the tactical air navigation system, or TACAN. If one of these systems is used, the position can be determined more precisely, since we will have distance information. To understand this better, let's look at an example of a VOR without any supplementary system. 
In this case, the pilot knows that the aircraft is on the 022 radial from the VOR, but since he does not know the distance, the aircraft could be here, or here, or here. While on the other hand, if we are navigating with a VOR DME, then the pilot knows the radial and the distance from the station, allowing him to determine the exact position of the aircraft. Now, the same principle can also be used to determine the exact position of visual checkpoints on the ground. Here for example, if we are determining the position of a town using a VOR without DME, we know the radial, but not the distance, so that town could be here, or here, or here. On the other hand, if we use a VOR DME, then we can figure out the exact position of the town in terms of a radial and a distance from the station. With all this in mind let's look at the following example. Here we have a VOR DME called San Antonio, and there are many visual checkpoints nearby. In this case, we could use a chart and a plotter to determine the approximate radial and distance of each checkpoint in relation to San Antonio VOR, and then use that information as reference to assist navigation in a VFR flight. Now, besides this, there is another way to determine the exact position of an aircraft or checkpoint using two nav aids at the same time. In this case, if we determine the radial or QDR from more than one nav aid, we can figure out the exact position of the aircraft without distance information, as we can see in this example. And just like in the previous cases, we can use this technique to determine the position of a visual checkpoint on the ground. Let's see a practical example of this. Here we have a VR and an NDB, and between them there are a couple of visual checkpoints, which are a lake and a town called Glarus. In this case, we could determine the approximate QDRs from the NDB and the approximate radials from the VR in order to create fixes that identify the checkpoints. So in case we are planning a VFR route, we could use more than one nearby nav aid to apply these techniques. In this particular example, we are using a VOR DME and an NDB, so the radial and distance techniques we saw earlier are combined. Now that we know how to use this nav aids in practice, let's look at how to determine the radial or QDR of a checkpoint manually using a chart and a plotter. First we have to say that the radials are measured in relation to magnetic north, not true north, so instead of using the true course, we have to use the magnetic course. Remember that the magnetic course is equal to the true course, plus or minus the magnetic variation of the area. If there is a west variation, then we have to add, and if there is an east variation, we have to subtract. So in practice, the first step is to measure the true course between the nav aid and the checkpoint using the plotter. And then, the second step is to apply the magnetic variation correction to obtain the magnetic course which will be the approximate radial or QDR. Let's see a practical example of this. Let's say we want to determine the radial from Tatamo Vior that passes over the town of Salinas. Here, the first step is to measure the true course between the VOR and the checkpoint using the meridians as reference. So using the plotter, we determine the true course of 102. Now, as we can see, the nearest isogonic line indicates a magnetic variation of 9 degrees west, which means that in order to obtain the magnetic course, we have to add that value to the true course of 102, thus obtaining a magnetic course of 111 as a result. This way, we know that the approximate radial that passes over Salinas is the 111. Now that we have seen how nav aids can be used as reference in VFR flights, Let's now move on to the GNSS. GNSS stands for Global Navigation Satellite System, and as its name suggests, it is based on the use of satellite signals to determine the current position of the aircraft and eventually navigate. Now, even though the most famous GNSS system is the GPS, there are many others, such as GLONASS from Russia, Galileo from the European Union, and Beidou from China. However, independently of the GNSS system used, a special dedicated receiver is required. For IFR flights, certified integral equipment is required in order to use it for performance-based navigation operations. However, for VFR flights there is not such requirement, since the GNSS is used for reference only. 
So regarding the use of GNSS in VFR flights, by providing graphical information of the aircraft's position in relation to the surrounding terrain, it is a very useful tool for this type of operation. And in addition to this, specialized GNSS equipment for aviation provides a variety of information about terrain, airspaces, nav aids, airports, among other useful data. Many systems even allow visual checkpoints to be created manually by the pilot to build custom routes or procedures. Now, since there is no specific regulation about the use of GNSS systems in VFR flights, we can find in the market a variety of devices in different presentations and with different functionalities. We can find GNSS systems integrated to the aircraft avionics, such as the Garmin G1000. We can also find portable GNSS devices, such as the Garmin ERA 500. Or we can find mobile apps that use the GNSS receiver of portable devices, such as cell phones or tablets, such as the Air Navigation Pro. Now, as mentioned before, VFR flights must use visual references in dead reckoning as the primary method of navigation. So when it comes to the use of GNSS systems in this type of operation, there are some important considerations to take into account. Some of these are, make sure that the navigation database of the device is up to date and the information presented is correct. That the device is sufficiently charged for the flight, in case you are using a portable device. That acceptable and accurate satellite signals are received. That you are familiar with the GNSS system and know how to use it. That you compare and verify the position information provided by the system in relation to other navigation systems or methods available. And last but not least, never use a GNSS system as the only navigation reference in VFR flights, since this may lead to complacency and a possible controlled flight into terrain. So to summarize, nav aids and GNSS systems are useful tools that can greatly assist navigation in VFR flights, since they help the flight crew to increase situational awareness and maintain proper spatial orientation, especially when flying over unfamiliar areas or airports. However, these should be used responsibly and as a complementary system, not as the primary method of navigation. I hope the information presented in this video was useful. If so, don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. Thanks for watching.